tropical waters, there lives a purplish soft coral, which scientists have named Gorgonia ventolina. Divers, snorkelers, and marine enthusiasts simply call it sea fan. Although it resembles a plant, the sea fan is actually a colony of small animals. These tightly meshed organisms extend from a central skeleton to form polyps, clumped together on the branches. Growing to be about two to six feet high, these aquatic animals prefer shallow water, but can live in as deep as 100 feet. Recently, the fans have been dying in an alarming rate. A land-based fungus called Aspergillus has been infecting sea fans throughout the Caribbean, the Bahamas, and the Florida Keys. Scientists have been scrambling to provide basic information about this sea fan killer. Normally, um, a sea fan is a light, light purplish to blue color and looks very uniform just with some brownish polyps on the surface. And when they're sick, there are large lesions. And when I say sick, I mean sick with the fungus aspergillus, which is what we're specifically studying. So the kinds of symptoms that we identify uh, this microorganism by are the production of large lesions on the surface of the colony, uh, tumors, and purple spotting. Scientists Drew Harvell and Kehoe Kim were originally interested in studying the disease-resistant properties of coral for use in human medicine. Instead, they found themselves investigating a disease epidemic within the sea fans themselves. This epizootic or epidemic of Aspergillus began sometime in the early 90s, we think, and was first detected um, in about 1994 by Ivan Nagelkirchen in Curaçao. He then raised the alarm throughout the Caribbean and associated labs of what's called CARICOMP or the Association of Marine Labs throughout the Caribbean took up the monitoring to demonstrate that this epidemic in sea fans was Caribbean wide. Um, he and a colleague, Garrett Smith, then were able to isolate from these six sea fans Aspergillus and identify it as the causative microorganism. While Aspergillus was infecting sea fans throughout the Caribbean, it had also infiltrated the coral reefs in the Florida Keys. Scientists were puzzled by this land-based fungus that had a history of infecting humans, even insects, but had no record of attacking marine organisms. Land diseases were essentially quarantined to land. This no longer seemed to be the case. As biologists, I, I, we teach our students that there are different kinds of ecosystems on our planet. There are terrestrial ecosystems and there are marine ecosystems. And, and for the most part, they're fairly disjuncted. There, there nothing really happens between those two uh, environments. And so uh, we think of disease processes that occur on land as one set of processes and disease processes that occur in, in, uh, in, in the ocean as another set of properties. And, and, and organisms that live on land don't really affect species that live on in the ocean for the most part. And so the idea that uh, a pathogen like Aspergillus is moving from one environment, one ecosystem, a terrestrial ecosystem to marine ecosystem is somewhat surprising, somewhat new, uh, particularly because it has impacted the marine environment so, so significantly, namely affecting sea fans. How has Aspergillus crossed the land-sea barrier? People are increasingly becoming aware of the interconnectedness of all life. But how did Aspergillus connect to the reefs? What road did the fungus travel when migrating from land to sea? There are three theories that scientists are currently exploring. The first theory is that Aspergillus fungus was transported in water runoff from land. This would explain the high levels of sea fan infections in the Florida Keys, but would not explain outbreaks in some remote parts of the Caribbean. Thus, scientists have developed a second theory, the African dust theory. The hypothesis states that wind-blown dust from North Africa carries microorganisms and deposits them in tropical waters. The third theory to explain the Aspergillus epidemic is that the fungus has always been present in the reef ecosystem, but has only recently been observed and documented. If it has always been present in the marine ecosystem, then why is there such an increase in observed infection in recent years? One possibility is global warming. Harvell, Kim, and their research assistants have done extensive laboratory research on Aspergillus and sea fans. What we observe as we increase temperature is that the fungus grows faster and faster at higher temperatures, whereas the extracts from the coral become less and less effective. So it's a double whammy at high temperature. The coral is stressed, and the pathogen is, in it, is reaching its optimal growth phase. Scientists certainly have reached consensus that global warming is occurring, and we've certainly, we're seeing the highest ocean temperatures we've seen in thousands of years now. 
Um, this is, has strong negative consequences for corals. In some ways, they may be the first organism to show a very clear, extremely negative impact to very small changes in temperature. Some have argued that, well, one or two degrees increase in temperature isn't really going to matter. To corals, it matters. They're right at their upper temperature threshold. They bleach, which is a clear sign of stress. Um, and then if the temperatures continue to go up, up, they die. An increase of one degree for marine ecosystems is comparable to an increase of 20 degrees for land ecosystems. Imagine the mortality rates for terrestrial organisms if it was regularly 110 degrees each summer. The mortality rates for sea fans throughout the Caribbean, the Bahamas, and the Florida Keys is staggering. Although the deaths are obvious to divers and snorkelers, a systematic scientific collection of data is needed to prove that action must be taken. Harvell and Kim have been monitoring the sea fan struggle from many different sites along the reef, enabling the scientists to examine different conditions and scenarios. We're getting mixed signals. Um, we're finding that some populations are doing better than others. For example, there's a small population on Conk Reef. Uh, we've monitored since 1997, and in, in between then and now, they've suffered about 60% mortality per year. And so this population now is substantially reduced uh, than it used to be. And there are sites uh, in the northern part of the Florida Keys, like Carries Fort, where the population has actually done fairly well. Differences in survival rates between monitoring sites may be caused by environmental factors, such as water quality. But how within one site can an individual sea fan die? Well, just a few feet away, another is unaffected. We think that there are a couple of reasons why certain individuals do better than others. One reason is that they may be genetically predisposed to being susceptible to disease, just like humans are. And so these are individuals that are first to get hit and perhaps first to, to die out because of the epizootic. And there are individuals who are, are less susceptible to disease, and so they do much better and either never get the infection, or if they do get the infection, are successful in fighting the disease off. There are a few resilient sea fans that seem unaffected by aspergillus. But these few cannot take away the fact that entire populations are being wiped out. The worst case scenario is that all the sea fans become extinct and that they're, they're completely decimated by this disease. Um, we don't know whether that will happen, although we have been able to track virtual local extinction at some of our sites. Um, managers from the sanctuary have contacted us about other sites where there have been massive sea fan die-offs. So I think it's a very real prospect that this, this could happen. But it's certainly notable that the, the reefs of the Florida Keys are dominated by sea fans, and that's one reason they're a good study organism for us. But um, to, ver to completely eradicate them would have, we think, probably long-standing impacts on that ecosystem. The eradication of sea fan populations could spell disaster for the reef ecosystem. Since the balance of an ecosystem can be thrown off by the removal of a species, neighboring corals could be endangered. Also, aspergillus may be a threat to populations other than sea fans. The sea fans could be an indicator for future epidemics. An indicator species is one that um, provides an unusual level of surveillance or, or indication that something adverse is happening in the environment. And we think of the sea fans as a potential indicator species for overall reef health. And one of the reasons is that they're sessile, so they stay in one place. The colonies are very large and apparent, and the disease symptoms on the colonies are very large and apparent. So even untrained observers could eventually be able to go into the environment and measure the prevalence or the, the amount of spread or the degree of, of infestation. Um, of this microorganism. Another benefit of sea fans as an indicator species is that when it dies, it leaves behind its skeleton, which is composed of a hard substance called calcium carbonate. Therefore, the remains of dead sea fans do not immediately disintegrate. Visitors to just about any reef can witness the destruction left behind by the fungus aspergillus. We must remember that although it may be the fungus that's causing the death of the sea fans, it's the human element that is most likely the root source of the destruction. So while we must continue to support individuals like Drew Harvell and Kehoe Kim, and organizations like the National Marine Sanctuary and Reef Relief, we must also do our own part.
One way to help the environment is to plant native vegetation. When choosing species for your yard or garden, choose carefully. Your decision can have a major impact on the ecosystem. Chris Berg of the Nature Conservancy explains the fundamental differences in types of vegetation. Well, when people talk about the difference between native plants and exotic plants, I think that it's, it's really important to, to get your terms straight. Native plants are obviously species that have been found here naturally. They were not introduced by people. And exotic plants um, typically are species, or always are species that are from another area of the globe. Uh, the difference between an exotic plant and an invasive exotic plant is that the invasive exotics have proven themselves to be capable of, of uh, seeding into uh, natural areas and overtaking natural areas. Uh, some examples of those are Brazilian peppers and Australian pines. And as the names imply, they're not from South Florida. They're from Brazil, Australia, wherever they may be from. And in their own native habitat, they're an important and healthy part of the natural ecosystem. Having been introduced into South Florida, where they have no predators and uh, they really are out of balance with the ecosystem, they can very easily uh, take over and displace native species. And when you lose your native plant species, you can then also have negative impacts on native wildlife. This is the seven-year apple, and it's a very salt-tolerant plant common along the backsides of dunes and uh, coastal berms throughout the Keys. This one will grow in uh, most any yard if you care for it properly, but it's particularly adapted to salty conditions and does well uh, along canals or along natural shorelines. It's got a very attractive uh, flower with a, a nice, not super strong, but a nice odor. Over here behind us, we can see the fruits of this seven-year apple. They don't really bloom every seven years or fruit every seven years, as the name suggests, but they do have one of the largest native fruits in the Keys. A lot of our native plants are, are good for attracting butterflies in the Florida Keys, uh, basically because Florida Keys has 67% of Florida's butterfly representative species and 10% of North America's species. So when you do landscape to attract wanted wildlife, you know, butterflies, uh, you have a chance of, of putting a wildlife refuge in your yard. Uh, also, uh, by planting uh, native uh, plants to attract butterflies, uh, you kind of bridge the gap between uh, developed areas and natural areas and you could be responsible for a species uh, surviving. Uh, palm trees, two different types of palms. One on the left is uh, the common coconut palm, which most people are familiar with, and a lot of people think is a native species, although it's not. It's not particularly invasive in any way, so it's not a, it's not a harmful exotic, but it's not native to the Florida Keys or even to anywhere in North or South America. Next to it, the shorter palm with the uh, kind of more wispy leaves is the cabbage palm or sable palm. This is Florida's state tree and this comparison really illustrates the difference uh, that the size and type of fruit makes for wildlife. There is not a single animal, native animal in the Keys that knows what to do with a, a coconut as big as a football. They can't get through the husk, they can't get through the hard shell. They would certainly like to because there's a lot of nutritious uh, meat inside. But those are basically useless for native wildlife. Both beautiful trees, uh, but one has a substantial benefit for wildlife. The other, uh, more of a benefit for people. While the human population in the Florida Keys is increasing, wildlife habitat is shrinking. Residential yards filled with native vegetation can reduce the stress on wildlife. Not only the wildlife that inhabits the Keys year round, but also those creatures just passing through. The Florida Keys are a really important migratory pathway for neotropical uh, birds, including songbirds like our warblers and uh, many of the other small songbirds, and also for raptors, uh, hawks and falcons and so forth. And those things, as they're traversing from North America to South America, most of the uh, eastern uh, individuals all the way up into Canada and the US come down and funnel down through the Keys, which are a very narrow 
uh, chain of islands. And if there's nothing for them to eat along that chain, they stand a m much less of a chance of reaching Cuba and then the Caribbean islands and then ultimately Central or South America, which is their next big source of food. So if, there's, if there are no native plants and therefore uh, no native wildlife uh, along their path, they uh, stand a diminished chance of, of making it. Helping wildlife to survive is reason alone to create native landscaping. But there are many more incentives for communities in Florida and especially in the Keys. One reason is the conservation of energy. Well, it's, it's very important uh, to keep in mind that native species have a variety of benefits other than just uh, for wildlife and other than just aesthetic benefits. Um, they can help you by providing shade. They can reduce the cooling costs of your house. They can, in, they can reduce your landscape maintenance costs over the long term by uh, reducing the needs for trimming and watering and fertilizing and so forth. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, they reduce the need for heavy watering. A lot of the exotic species, be they good or, or bad exotics, uh, are not adapted to the periodic seasonal drought that we have here in the Keys. And this is the gumbo limbo tree. Uh, it's usually referred to as a tourist tree because it looks like uh, sunburned tourist skin peeling here. But if you need a tree that uh, will give you a lot of shade and to cover your whole house, it's not that invasive on the uh, structures, but the gumbo limbo tree. By planting native species in your yard, you will not only save money, you'll save time. When planting exotics, prepare for a long uphill struggle to keep a species alive in an environment that is hostile and foreign to them. The uh, native species in general are hardier than uh, our exotics, not necessarily hardier than the invasive exotics, which are basically uh, bulletproof, but the, many of the exotics are not adapted to either hurricane uh, storm force winds or our droughts. This is wild coffee. Uh, this plant, although it's thriving out here in the sun, is also fairly shade tolerant. It's in the coffee family as the name implies and the berries that you see here are similar to coffee beans on the inside but you do not want to eat them. They're actually toxic. Fundamentally, natives are, are able to withstand our extreme of our climatic uh, experiences or in, environment where they can uh, respond from drought. They have a certain amount of drought tolerance. Uh, they have a certain amount of salt tolerance. Uh, they uh, actually respond well to flooding um, and you know the, all the host of all our environmental impacts or n natural environmental impacts. Um, also, uh, use native ground covers instead of turf, uh, which is responsible for a lot of our uh, lawn maintenance chemicals. For the people who have waterfront properties and everything like that, who are constantly trying to landscape it, uh, native grasses, a lot of your marine grasses, especially your Spartina grasses, are great for seashore growth. Uh, they do several things here. Not only do they trap some of the sand and dust in the air with their leaves and then funnel it down to secure themselves, they actually will stabilize this land against erosion. The difference between a lawn of exotic grass and the planting of native grass is important when considering the health of our reef and marine ecosystems. The decision may seem small, but the power of one may make the difference for the future of our environment. The use of natives, uh, consequently, you, you're not applying a lot of, of dangerous chemicals that will percolate down through our porous limestone and eventually wind up in our nearshore areas. Uh, a lot of these chemicals, if you read the labels, will tell you that it's not to be used around water and no one lives more than two miles away from water anywhere in the Keys. 
Uh, also, the use of fertilizers. Uh, if you're not using a slow release fertilizer, once again, it gets washed out beyond the root zone where the plant can't utilize it anyway, and then it goes out into our nearshore water area where you produce algae blooms and uh, just put more nutrient loading on our nearshore areas. While many feel that fertilizers are essential for a healthy garden, there are alternatives to fertilizers that aren't harmful to our marine ecosystems. The main difference between us and the mainland is we don't have a lot of organic debris in our soil or we don't have uh, minerals. Uh, we have a lot of uh, salts and limestone derivatives. Um, so you could compost uh, to recycle plant nutrients. Uh, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, different organic products like seaweed uh, will give you minerals uh, as long as you wash the salt out and uh, things like that. And, and compost is probably, and mulch is the holy grail of landscaping down here. This is Jamaica caper. And this is, uh, in my view, one of the most attractive of the uh, Florida native trees or shrubs. It can be kept low and, and trimmed to be a shrub. You plant them in series and you can trim them just like any other shrub, uh, like any hedge. But it also can get quite large. I've seen them as, as tall as 30 or 40 feet in uh, the West Palm Beach area on some islands. Here you can see the flower of the Jamaica caper. Uh, pretty white and purple color. Very long uh, stamens. And again the beautiful foliage, the dark green above with the uh, lighter uh, grayish silvery color below. These are actually some of the uh, shorter stamened Jamaica capers that I've seen. Some of these will get to be up as, as long as five inches. This is one of my favorites. It's the sea grape. And this is in the buckwheat family. Um, sea grape to my eye has one of the greatest foliages. It's a large plate shaped leaf. It's got a lot of uh, red in the veins, dark green above and paler below. Um, this is one of uh, several trees in the Keys that actually does provide us with a little bit of color. Uh, the leaves will turn red before they fall. Uh, not necessarily in the fall, but typically in the dry season. And then they'll come back right away. They don't, they don't stay bare for very long. Not considering the beautiful red leaves of the sea grape, detractors of indigenous landscaping often claim that exotics are more beautiful than natives. Although beauty is in the eye of the beholder, one need only behold the beautiful blues on the lingam vitae tree or join the vast populations of butterflies and hummingbirds that enjoy the bright red flowers of the flame bush. There is much support for those who wish to transform their yard into a Florida yard. It need not be a chore, but an adventure in learning about local nature in a way of reconnecting with our environment. Florida Yards and Neighborhoods, an extension service of the University of Florida, has programs throughout the state. Contact them at 305-292-4901 or visit their website at monroe.ifis.ufl.edu. Or get in touch with the Nature Conservancy and find out about their numerous educational outreach programs and their annual plant fair.